Welcome to the Gen Z Stoic Podcast, where every week we strive to lead younger generations on a path to virtue through the insight of Stoic teachings and personal stories from our lives as Gen Z Stoics. Welcome to this week's episode of the Gen Z Stoic Podcast. This week we're going to be covering what is certainly a controversial, maybe a contentious topic, but one that's timely and an interesting perspective, at least from the lens of Stoicism, and that is the concept of war and peace and how we deal with that using philosophy and applying it to modern times. Now, there's obviously the situation in Russia and Ukraine, there's the situation in Israel and Gaza, and while it's a very politically motivated conversation around both of those conflicts, we want to start out this episode by saying that there's no real political motivation here, but we're approaching the perspective of these conflicts and over the overall perspective on war just strictly from the view of stoicism so with that out of the way i think we should lead with something that we've talked about before on the podcast and that's the stoic concept of cosmopolitanism now if you go check out our fourth of july episode a while back that we did it if you want a more in-depth sense of what stoic cosmopolitanism is go check out that episode but basically what it boils down to that is that as humans we all share one unique thing that separates us from animals, and that is reason, the ability to perceive things and, for example, look at these two situations, these two conflicts, and come away with different perspectives. That's a unique thing that humans and Stoics argued that because it's a separating factor that separates humans from animals, it means that we as human beings can all live together as equals. And with that perspective in mind, right, we can kind of see where Stoics would then argue for peace. Now that's the overall theme of this episode is that Stoics always carried the banner of peace. War was seen as something that was an unfortunate result, an unfortunate outcome. Now it's ironic because Marcus Aurelius wrote a lot of meditations while he was on the battlefield. He was a famed military leader. But even though Stoics historically have been great warriors, the perspective for a Stoic is that war, while sometimes necessary, is always unfortunate. And the end result should always be peace. And that's an important perspective to keep as we go through the topics covered in today's episode. Right, so you mentioned the idea of cosmopolitanism and essentially the idea that all human beings are members of a single global community. So war goes basically against the principles of reason and justice like you were talking about. Um, so funnily enough, you mentioned that you know Marcus Aurelius was a Roman emperor. And so you're like, well, how could a Stoic be a, a Stoic and a Roman emperor at the same time? Well, one thing, interestingly, about Marcus Aurelius is he actually never claimed himself to be a Stoic. But more importantly, the big the big idea behind Stoics and war is that they recognize that war essentially is a last resort option. And we talked about how Stoicism views war as something that really is only necessary to defend yourself. And... The only reason to fight is if you're fighting for something you believe in, not your life is in danger, but you're fighting for something you don't believe in. That's not a probable cause. Fighting for something that you believe is correct is why Stoics would fight in the first place. That is the only reason a Stoic would ever stand up for themselves is if, is if they're defending something they truly resonate with. Epictetus has a quote that says, if you want to make peace, you don't talk to your friends, you talk to your enemies, which we know that in order to achieve peace whether it's like local community world peace you have to you know engage with the people that disagree with you just by talking to your friends you're not going to get anywhere if you're already at peace so you have to talk to the people on the opposing viewpoints but as we can see today you know like you said there's wars all over the world right now peace isn't necessarily always achieved through just you know appeasement it's not easy it's it can be very violent when two sides are unwilling to come to a con, uh, consensus a shared common ground between the two so peace is the ultimate goal that stokes are trying to achieve but it's not probable in stopping war and sometimes war is the only way to achieve peace is what the stoics did acknowledge so i would like to just make a personalized statement about marcus Aurelius because that is who i usually talk about the most as a stoic and as we mentioned he was a roman emperor and he spent a lot of time at war specifically he spent 12 years of his life at war and he told himself how useless the 
praise from the people was. People praised him for being such a great leader in war. And he often told himself that it was worthless. Like being praised is like a great war leader wasn't something that he wanted. He was really only fighting for something that he believed in. He wasn't doing it for the praise. He wasn't doing it for everyone else's validation. He was simply only fighting to achieve peace. And that's kind of the overall theme of Stoics, if you look at it. Stoics throughout history have been really great warriors. And obviously that makes sense. Stoics have, there's very few things with even within the course of war that can kind of knock you on your path. And so if your path is a just war and fighting for a just cause, doing just things, fighting ethically, and all of these kind of requirements that Stoics had within their own lives to even go to war, then they're obviously going to be good warriors. But it's you have to emphasize the fact that even though they were good warriors and the military even now preaches Stoicism, there are famed military leaders within the U.S. Uh, Army, Navy, all these branches that emphasize the need for every U.S. citizen to read meditations or read different kind of Stoic books. But the analogy that I like to use is that while Stoics are great in the military, military and the concepts used in the military are not great for Stoics. And that's the concept I think we hold here today, even in modern times, is that if you're somebody who wants to get into Stoicism, if you're somebody who's practiced Stoicism or is practicing Stoicism, then these situations, these conflicts that we've seen over the past couple of years, even the conflicts that go back to the Iraqi war and post 9-11, these conflicts don't really meet the criteria for what a Stoic would deem as a just war. Some of those criteria, you, 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 we've already mentioned, you could think about a just cause, just intentions, something that's a last resort, which is something that Stoics viewed war as, as it was always a last resort, and proportionality of response, right? If somebody wrongs you, you don't go beat them up, beat them half to death, because then you're going to jail. And that's something that's just preached in everyday Stoic talk. Seneca, I really like Seneca's perspective on this. He talks about how if a dog bit you, or a mule or a horse kicked you, you wouldn't go do the same thing to that. Could you imagine doing that if some chihuahua bit you? You're not going to go kick the chihuahua and bite the chihuahua because that's insane. You're going to get called a psychopath, and that is kind of psychopathic behavior. Same thing if a horse kicks you. You're not going to go try and kick the horse. A, you'd probably lose that fight, but B, that makes no sense. Any human being who possesses <clears throat> any kind of common sense would not do those things. Instead, you know, maybe you get angry at the dog and you say, well, I don't like that dog. But still, it's just what dogs do. Like, like <laughs> that's what you're gonna. That's the regular course of action. You're gonna say, "Well, maybe I don't hang around that dog anymore." But you're not gonna go punt the dog halfway across the yard. So, <laughs> when, so when we talk about these things, it's kind of, it's a silly example, but that kind of reasoning stands the test of time when it comes to you know whether it's a dog or whether it's war. If some if some nation or country wrongs you where like they make fun of one of your customs, what harm did that really do? In our political world, there's a lot of shots at foreign countries and kind of name calling and all this stuff to get people riled up about these conflicts. And in reality, the most appropriate response is who cares? If some foreign leader says something about an American tradition, okay, that's their perspective. I mean, we certainly as Americans say a lot of foul things about foreign traditions. So from my perspective here, it, it's just the same kind of perspective, whether it's this low, low level of like somebody disrespects you or kind of insults you on the street versus these national conflicts. They kind of follow the similar track of human emotion, human reaction, and the regular person who lets emotions control them, and that's why you need a stoic leader, I think, as a politician, is going to say, oh, we're going to send troops into their country and we're going to bomb them, and yada, yada, yada. And that's not proportional. It's not proportional and it's not just. When we see these two conflicts, applying my interpretation of the Stoic perspective, taken from these quotes, taken from even modern Stoics who have uh, tried to apply these concepts of cosmopolitanism, Stoic justice to these concepts, when you look at the Israel-Gaza situation, when you look at the Ukraine-Russia situation, there's no just cause whatsoever. And I would even go so far as to say, until maybe World War II, if we go all the way back through history until World War II, there has been no war that has met any of these conditions that a Stoic would say this is a just cause to go and fight for. So I'm not 
advocating for draft dodging or going and protesting the war. I'm not advocating for any of those things, but I'm saying when you take a look at what Stoics say in terms of their concept of cosmopolitanism, Stoic justice, which emphasizes self-preservation, 9-11 happened, thousands of people lost their lives. That's sad, but more people lost their lives in the Middle East. And when we think about it in terms of self-preservation, it wasn't really worth it. And we have that perspective now, but if you maintain that Stoic perspective, instead of going into these conflicts, giving billions, trillions of dollars to go bomb foreign citizens who truthfully don't deserve it and ruin families, ruin countries, ruin economies. Instead of saying, seeing the aftermath and saying, oh, well, that was a bad thing. Why did we do that? If you apply the Stoic perspective, all of a sudden we're saying we shouldn't be in these conflicts in the first place. And I think that's kind of my conclusion when we look at the situations we're currently seeing in modern times. No Stoic would ever agree to the idea of like total war, which is like you said, the bombing of civilians and innocent people. And also simply going to war just to gain power over another territory, I also don't think any Stoics would be for because that simply is stemming from greed, wanting more and more and more. So like you said, after World War II, you have these wars that no don't really mat, meet the criteria of what a just cause is to fight for something. And you mentioned that analogy that being stoic will help in war, but not everything in war will help you be stoic, is the people who were stoic in times of war typically had better, you know, self and like endurance, self-control, inner strength, and were able to persevere. There's an example of a prisoner who got shot down over Vietnam is essentially this James Stockdale. He was shot down over Vietnam and ended up spending more than seven years in a Vietnamese prison and he wrote about how stoicism saved his life and the specific aspect of stoicism that he was talking about that saved his life was how he practiced you know confronting the and i'm quoting from the daily stoic confronting the grim reality of his situation without giving in to despair and depression stoics like to say face reality no matter what it is trying to create this alternate fate you know hoping having expectations you're just going to get let down and you're going to find disappointment and you're going to fall into, quote, despair and depression. So, and the idea coming out of that is that when it comes to war and how Stoics would approach a war, it would be very, it would take a long time to actually get to fighting because there would be so many aspects of the situation analyzed before fighting even becomes an option. We essentially, your example after 9-11, just resorted to, you know, going out to the Middle East, taking revenge, bombing, right? So that's not exactly something that a Stoic would do. A quote, like you said, the best revenge is to be unlike your enemy, Marcus Aurelius. And that's absolutely true. We see, and this is not a political conversation, but we see today with all the wars going on, it's hard to find just causes. A lot of them have, you know, motives to take over a certain population of people to enforce their ideas. That isn't something that Stoics do. Stoics don't force their ideas on anyone. A Stoic wouldn't take over an area just to enforce Stoicism, no. A Stoic would always speak their mind, but would never force an opinion on anybody. It's essentially sp leading by your example, and then people are simply influenced to be better individuals, and then they follow from there. I feel like oftentimes, reasons we go to war today as you can see are simply emotion based there's no logic behind the decision being made which is another reason why it falls deeply far from stoicism is there's no logical reasoning behind you know attacking countries and bombing countries simply to force ideas or gain power that's not really a logical reason the most logical reason to fight is to defend something you believe in instead of forcing it on someone else it all ties back to the same idea to that one similar idea of thinking logically before making a big decision like going to war. And I want to take the time to compare two different speeches here, or not maybe speeches, but one is President Bush after 9-11, and then one is a passage from Seneca's letters from a Stoic. It's from Letters 95. Now, following the 9-11 attack, and I want to say I'm not dismissing the lives lost during 9-11. Obviously, like we weren't alive for that, so we don't understand the national impact of that fully. But I just want to compare the two speeches with that being said. He says that the search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. Now, this I'm highlighting this part of President Bush's speech following 
due to the last line, we will make no distinction between the terrorists who commit, committed these acts and those who harbor them. That's what resulted in us basically bombing the living hell out of the Iraqi people, out of Afghanistan, in search of these terrorists. Now, some will say, hey, that's justified because they came in and killed thousands of our people. First of all, Stoics would not say that an eye for eye is just. They would not say that it's worth it. We keep emphasizing, not only in this episode, but in many other episodes, how the best form of revenge is to not be like your enemy. You don't go out there and just because somebody attacked you, you attack them. Now, it plays different when there's a terrorist attack and there's thousands of lives lost, of course. But I want to compare that last line, or not maybe compare, but take that last line, how we basically do not care whether you're a terrorist or whether you're harboring terrorists or near a terrorist. We're going to come find you and we're going to do harm to you. And then compare it to what Seneca says about war. He says, we are mad, not only individually, but nationally. We check manslaughter and isolated murders, but what of war and the much vaunted crime of slaughtering whole peoples? There are no limits to our greed, none to our cruelty. And as long as such crimes are committed by stealth and by individuals, they are less harmful and less pretentious. But cruelties are practiced in accordance with acts of Senate and popular assembly, and the public is bidden to do that which is forbidden to the individual. Deeds that would be punished by loss of life when committed in secret are praised by us because uniform generals have carried them out. It plays hand in hand here. What Seneca is saying here is that imagine if we if we took President Bush's statement and applied it to our own lives. Like somebody went and beat your little sister up. So your response is, I'm going to go find that person and whoever lives with that person and I'm going to kill them or I'm going to do something horrendous to them. Nobody would agree with that statement. Maybe people would say, okay, I understand, but nobody would agree with that statement that just because somebody wronged you, I'm going to go wrong anybody that's asso even associated with them. But Seneca's highlighting here that that kind of logic doesn't apply when it comes to war. And that's something that I find very interesting is it seems like, honestly, that passage and President Bush's speech just go hand in hand in highlighting the degeneracy and the hypocr hypocrisy that comes with war. If we went in and we did these atrocities that we've done to people as a country historically to our own citizens, which actually we have done before, I won't get into that though, but if, we, if some citizen decided that it was of their own accord to do that to fellow citizens of the United States, we would all be up in arms and we would say, we're going to go find this person. This person can't be on the streets. It's a dangerous society. But they throw on an American uniform and they go do that to people who don't live in this country. And that's fine. And it's not just a U.S. example. Many countries have done that throughout history. But obviously living in the United States, we have that perspective of this is what we've done as a country. Not everybody has that perspective. It takes a little bit of research. But it's interesting to compare Seneca's perspective on this because it's 100% true. Seneca's, Seneca is saying here that all of these atrocities, all of this greed as you know, defense contractors are rolling through the dough when it comes to these two conflicts. They're making and producing bombs and weapons en masse, shipping it to these two areas and just seeing green all the time. And that's what our country operates on. That's what really war operates on. War operates on greed and cruelty. We think about psychologically, I think about the Stanford prison experiment. No, exactly what that is. Where they yeah. took these random people off the street, some were prisoners, some were prison guards. They were put in the roles of prisoners and prison guards. It was a simulation. No constraints were really given. And then with three days, they had to, sh within three days, or four, I don't really actually know. The short specifics. amount of time, very short. But very amount short time. amount of time, it devolved to such depraved behavior from the prison guards towards the prisoners just because they were anonymous and they were yeah. given these roles that they had to shut down the experiment. Now think about the dark units like SEAL Team 6, like all the teams that we have that have been in these positions in the Middle East. They're anonymous, they've been given the role, and they're trained killers. Think about the cruelties that they've done. And if you truly sit down and think about it, and you can somehow justify to that, that to yourself, I, I, I can't agree with you. When I sit down and I think about these things, I don't care whether they're American, whether they're from a foreign country, whether they're from a country that's attacked us in the past. There's no justification for that kind of treatment towards other human beings. And that's a cosmopolitan perspective. I hate to label it as a cosmopolitan perspective because it truthfully should be a just human being, human dignity perspective. But when we compare the stoic perspective of everybody as a human being who deserves the basic level of respect, equality, because we all possess the ability to reason equally, and we compare it to the logic that we've used to get into war after war, it becomes clear that Stoics do not agree with war. Stoics see through 
the kind of sham that war is as something that parlays to the greedy in defense contractor positions, parlays to the cruel, and parlays to the people who do not have the best interests of the world in mind. And so when you look at these two conflicts, while you may say, oh, what Hamas did is terrible, or oh, what Israel is doing to Gaza is terrible, or, or Russia, Ukraine, what Russia did to Ukraine is terrible. There's very few people who say what Ukraine is doing in terms of defending their country is terrible. But you have all of these perspectives, and yet it doesn't really look at the other side. We can't now, I feel like it is somewhat of a popular opinion to say that it's a horrible atrocity on both sides and Absolutely. the conflict needs to stop and there needs to be a ceasefire. Overall, the war is horrible, yes. And that would be the stoic perspective. I think when people, we see it on college campuses where they're like free Palestine and they don't consider the Israel perspective or there's pro-Israel people who are Islamophobic. Both sides, I think, are disgusting in terms of they don't see the other side and they aren't able to see themselves as cosmopolitans and instead see themselves as partisan actors. And the only thing that that accomplishes is the deaths of more people. And so when Stoics talk about, hey, the final resolution to war should always be peace, those people don't want that. So when you see those people protesting, it may seem like they're standing up for a good cause. No, nope, depending on what your personal beliefs are, you may side with one side or the other. But both sides are evil in the fact that the longer they protest and don't see the other side, the longer the conflict drags out and the more deaths we see. And that's, I think, equally an atrocity compared to what's going on within the situation, is that we are seeing a continuance because of the inability for us to see the other side. It's interesting you say that too, because what Stoics mean by peace isn't necessarily one side being right. Stoics would rather have two sides disagreeing, but not at war, than being at war simply just to be correct. So like you were saying, the sides that like, yes, yeah, standing up for what you believe in, absolutely, but failing to see the validity in any other side's argument or at least attempting to respect that someone else is going to have a different opinion or viewpoint is where it becomes an issue. So when Stokes say we want peace, that means we just don't want to fight. Like if we don't agree, totally fine. But fighting and only seeing our side as being correct is, and like I said, I feel like a Stoic would take a more defensive side and the Stoics would be more likely to defend their home than to attack another territory is what, is what I would say. A lot of it, stems from greed is the reason we see wars nowadays the greed for power the greed to just be in control this thirst for power that really is the downfall of so many great kingdoms as they get too greedy they want too much and eventually you know what goes around comes around and it backfires so you you brought up a ton of great points and i will say that i'm not as educated on you know, the history of wars politically, just as much of the facts as you are, which is why I don't necessarily want to speak to, to too many things and be incorrect. But I will say, you know, there are, I'm familiar with every single thing that you've mentioned necessarily, maybe not in depth. The Stanford prison experiment was interesting because while these people were not, they were just regular people off the streets, put in roles, just, just a label thrown at them. And after a few days, they were, harming other people because it was their quote role you know it was it was interesting the psychology i'd be interested in looking more in the psychology of what you know people are thinking during war but i feel like to an extent if you analyze both sides enough it's pretty obvious that a lot of motives behind why you would attack something are emotionally driven and not and they're not logical like you said the thirst just for greed that's really the downfall of many many kingdoms and emperors in the past as well is just greed the the want for power the want to just expand infinitely in conclusion for me with war when it comes to peace that doesn't mean one side is right one side is wrong it means avoiding fighting and avoiding casualties altogether it's it's no doubt in the the comparison between the george bush statement and the stoic and seneca's letter it's two completely different ideas but right together not saying George Bush isn't Stoic, but that, that statement is not how a Stoic would think at all. It's not about getting revenge. Oh, they hurt me, so I'm going to go hurt them back. It's like you said, it's very justifiable to, you know, if someone killed your mom or someone you love, it's justifiable to understand that you would be so angry, you know, that you want to go and get back at that person. That's justifiable. I mean, the pain, the anger, completely justifiable. But there's an analogy that if there is one murderer and you kill a murderer same amount of murder is left in the world you know what i mean you're not you're not doing anybody a favor so 
what that's i guess my final message when it comes to peace is peace is all about maybe not agreeing but having to agree to disagree but not going to war over it stoics like you said resent they did not enjoy war but they weren't opposed to war as a last resort situation if they had to defend what they believe in who they were and their legacy so it's important to note that while they did not want it they were not afraid to go to war if they absolutely had to and i think my final point is you talked about stoics defending their home versus going out and aggressing another person i still think when you are defending your home we go back to proportion of response. If somebody breaks into your home, unless they threaten your life, right? There's not a lot of reason to take it to the nth degree and just brutally kill that person. That's proportionality of response. Now, obviously, if they threaten your life, and this is where I tie in stoic justice in terms of self-preservation, it's very rare throughout the course of history that us Every citizen personally has been threatened. Their way of life, their well-being has been threatened. It's interesting. Again, I could go back to the Bush speech, but you can look it up for yourself. When American leaders are trying to get us to go into war, they frame it in two things, which is national security and our way of life is threatened. So it's actually ironic because they are appealing to the tenants that would call for Stoics to actually take up the cause and go to war. But it's a false narrative. There has never been, in the course of history, a conflict that threatens every single American's way of life. Maybe maybe the Civil War, our own conflicts. But if we think in terms of modern terms, think about the past couple of conflicts we've been in from Vietnam present. When in reality was the entire United States under threat, obviously, again, using a USA perspective, when, they were, when were they under threat of every person could have been killed, their homes would have been destroyed, and our way of life was threatened? Never. Never, and it's partially because we are a military power, we're a world power. But also, why can't we keep that perspective when we look at what's happening to Gaza? Again, I'm not arguing for either side here, I want to make that very clear. But Israel has bombed the living crap out of Gaza. Homes are gone. Women and children have been killed in mass. And the U.S. has been partially behind that. We give funding to Israel. We also give funding, funding to both sides of the war. Iran, <coughs> who then gives money to Hamas. A conspiracy so that is a fair... theory, but it's That's not a, a conspiracy theory. No, it's theory. not a conspiracy no, theory. No, it's not. We unfroze $6 billion that Iran sent directly back into Hamas. Anyway. Just but, just a fact, no bias behind that at all. Right. But we, send, we continue to send this money to Israel. We continue to support Israel. Now we're having some hesitation because they've bombed the living crap out of Gaza. But we've we have done the exact thing that would cause that would cause us from the stoic perspective to actually go to war we've destroyed their livelihood we've destroyed their schools they go to refugee camps because we bomb their homes and then we and then israel bombs that and yet we can't see why the war is wrong some people can't see why the war is wrong because they're focused on only which side they believe in is right and it's the same kind of partisan bs that we deal with in this country but the final message that I want to leave with today is that war is wrong. There, there has never really been a war where we can say that war is right. World War II, probably, because obviously the Holocaust, those kind of situations, Nazi Germany, world destruction, world order, maybe World War II qualifies. But other than and that... And even that, it's not a black and white issue. There are so many factors you have to look at to consider and determine something to be just. But other than that... War has been wrong, and that's the Stoic perspective to maintain. There's a lot of justification behind it. We haven't gotten right. into all of it, but the Stoic perspective is that war is wrong. War is an evil act, and it's an unfortunate outcome. And if we ever get to a point where, yes, our livelihoods are threatened, yes, there's a just cause, yes, we're fighting ethically, you know, we're not doing terrible things and doing cruel things, and our way of life is threatened, if it gets to that point, then I will sit up here and I will say war is justified. But when I look through history and then I think about what I believe philosophically, ethically, morally, war is wrong. And our participation in it as a third party in the U.S., Israel's participation in it, Hamas and Gaza, Ukraine, Russia, it's wrong. And it should be avoided. And as a school of philosophy, if Stoics like Marcus Aurelius or Seneca were alive today, there would be calls that it should immediately end. And there should be a peaceful resolution. And it shouldn't be looked at in terms of winners and losers because everybody wins when people stop dying. That's just about the best way that you can put it. Um, 
I think there is nothing wrong, you know, with defending, like I said, defending your home. So I don't think that my the spe specific example with Ukraine and Russia, I don't think Ukraine would be in the wrong for defending, you know, their home to the best of their ability. So the, the I think if there was any confusion with what you just said, it's, you know, a, attacking people simply just for power, for territory, for greed, reason, for greedy purposes is wrong. That these 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 motives in war that are just completely unjustified, completely wrong, and the civilians and the innocent lives that are, you know, the cost of these wars, it, it's wrong. All of it is wrong, absolutely. Um, the only and and all of what you just said, there was only one thing that I disagreed with. It actually wasn't even the religious part. You know, I believe, you know, with religion and stoicism, both are. Uh, things that I believe are supposed to guide you on your personal journey. It's supposed to be like an internalized, you know, self-guide. And with neither philosophy, stoicism, or religion, should you force it on somebody else and tell someone that they are wrong if they don't believe it. You can think that, but the actual act of enforcing and forcing something upon someone else is wrong in both cases. But the thing, the one thing that I disagreed with what you said, just slightly, is, you know, someone breaks into your home and... I don't necessarily agree that like your first option should be, you know, I had need to kill this person, but also we know like if you look at the statistics just in this situation anyway, um, a lot of times are armed robberies, so you don't know what an intention are. Sometimes robberies end up robberies gone wrong. Nothing ends up being stolen, but someone, you know, confronts the robber, they get shot, they die. Nothing ends up even being stolen. So that was the only thing I disagreed with. Very minor, doesn't actually really have to do with war philosophy. Not a big deal. Um, I was just listening to what you said, but overall the message with war, absolutely, you know, and I think you have something, uh, in your message that's absolutely correct when you say it should be avoided. And if the Stoics were here today to call to talk about that issue, they would agree that war should be avoided and there should be, you should take every measure before going to war to try and come to a consensus about what the solution or a compromise or just an agreement to disagree what that should look like but just simply like war has almost been a first resort in some cases just oh they don't believe what we believe we want them to do that boom bombs or they did this to us we're gonna go do it back boom bombs you know what i mean so there really hasn't and that's sort of just like a spark note summary of these situations but there could be many other precautions taken and measures taken to try and avoid more damage. But in summary, that's about it. So we can summarize by saying that you look at Stoic cosmopolitanism, you look at Stoic justice, any really Stoic value that's been emphasized throughout history, people have analyzed it in depth. You can go up, there's a lot of good academic papers around the Stoic view on war, how we compare just war theory to Stoicism. Very good papers out there. I would encourage you to read them. Some of them are very long. But the consensus is, is that war is wrong. And one final thing I said that is politically, one final thing that I'll say that it is politically motivated, and I haven't said it yet, is don't buy into the narrative of bipartisanism, especially in this country. I find it really ironic, and this is definitely not a unique view to me. But when we look at Ukraine and Russia, right, you have... Republicans on one side of the aisle who say, hey, we need to stop funding for Ukraine. You know, this is a terrible war. We don't need to be sending any more money to them. Basically, screw them. Yep. They instantly hop on the train of Israel. Israel has a right to defend themselves. They have a right to do whatever they want. We shouldn't question them. Just go watch the GOP debates. Flip side, Democrats have supported Ukraine throughout the course of the war. They continue to support Ukraine. Yet now are hesitant about supporting Israel. Ironically, they did support Israel at first, but now they're hesitant about it. So don't buy into this narrative because I think the root source of that is greed and cruelty where the people in power, the defense contractors, our $900 billion defense budget, just want to go to war so they can make money. And so we found two conflicts that both sides... Don't even mention the banks, man. We found anyway. two conflicts that combine the sides together on a common issue, which is war. Now, they disagree on both issues, but they come together to say, there's war. We have our treasury secretary who's saying we can afford two wars. Don't buy this narrative. If you invest in a narrative around these conflicts, invest in the narrative that we need a peaceful resolution right now for both conflicts and that war is wrong. And with that being said, 
This has been this week's episode of the Gen Z Stoic Podcast. A little bit hard-hitting than the previous few episodes, but back to some good content. As always, check out the website. We've been really active posting shorts, reels, all that good stuff. If you haven't checked those out, be sure to go check those out. Some highlights of previous yep. episodes. Also, be sure to check us out on Rumble if you haven't already. We recently just moved to Rumble. Um, and like you said, a lot of TikTok shorts, YouTube's just more um, activity in your feed. Trying to get out there, trying to push, uh, not push this message, but spread this message. And with that, this has been the Gen Z Stoic Podcast, a discussion around Stoics and war. And we will see you next week.